And welcome to the show. This is Pulp Mythos. I'm Brian here with Larry and Spencer, and we're going to be discussing the Suicide Squad. Uh, full spoilers ahead. I'm going to say that up front because we're going to dive right into it. If you've not hit the sub button, please do so. Lots of content on the channel. And let's start. Um, none of us have talked about this movie. Uh, I think I've texted a little bit with Spencer, but we, none of us have spoken about it. So I have no idea what Spencer O'Leary thinks truly about the film. A little bit of what Spencer thinks because he did text me a little. So I'm going to just open with, I loved it. There's stuff in it that I was shocked they got away with. Um, I can't wait to go into detail of what I liked. There was a few things that I didn't like, and we're going to definitely go into that. But my initial reaction was I this was a fantastic film to me. Um, I'm curious, guys, what it, what is your initial thoughts? Or did you like it as much, or do you have more problems with it? I, I liked when Jared Leto showed up and um, <laughs> it was in it. <laughs> I, it was funny because, I mean, I've texted both of you about how it was basically a trauma movie with a high budget that, you know, and better acting, obviously. But yeah, uh, the characters who were playing the, you know, the straight character, you, you had Amanda Waller who was this hard nosed and uh, God, for whatever reason, her name just came. Uh, Viola Day. Yeah, right. yeah. Like the actress's name is escaping, but she did such a good job playing that hard nosed character and with the, all the comedy around it. And, you know, the, the parts where you didn't see coming, the deaths you didn't see coming, the uh, survivals you didn't see coming, the, the backstabbing and everything else. I, from beginning to end, I was dying laughing the whole time, and I was entertained, and the action was great. It, to me, it was a... I've read this article, and they were talking about how this should be the, the new direction that DC goes, because with their failed <laughs> starts at trying to get... Um, when they tried to make the Justice League basically funny after Snyder pulled out, yeah. and, you know, all these things, they, they haven't had any direction. All the movies have been different. None of them have kind of been cohesive at all. They don't know what they're doing. And then I watch this and I'm like, well, this is what I want from DC. <laughs> I, yeah, absolutely, man. You know, I couldn't, I could not agree with that more. This is the kind of thing I wanted. And this is the best thing that they've made since the dark Knight trilogy. I'll say that much. That's how I feel about it. I, I absolutely love this movie. Agreed. It, ma it made me care about a character that I did not give a crap about before. You know, like when they announced like, oh, you know, Idris Elba will be Bloodsport. I'm like, who's Bloodsport? Like, I read comics all the time and I've, I've never heard of Bloodsport. You know, now I want to pick up some Bloodsport comics. You know, it's it was it was very cool. You know, it, all the characters felt like themselves. Like I, I love you mentioned uh, Amanda Waller because, you know, Viola Davis, like you said, she killed it in that role, you know, there's only, there's only one character I didn't really like. Uh, I'll say that's Harley Quinn, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, like she's still, and that's the only aspect I didn't like about the movie. And, you know, and some of the scenes with her, I liked, you know, so overall it's, uh, it's not just one of my favorite DC movies. It's one of my favorite comic book movies of all time. This, this felt like the suicide squad. Let's, well, let's go straight into Harley Quinn then. Um, because I do have an issue with the character. I think she was hand. I think the amount of screen time she had was was good. It wasn't too much, wasn't too little. I think it was just enough for the, for her fans. I think her little action scene was fine. I liked the interaction with her and their president. Um, I quite enjoyed the whole third act, even with her and the javelins, <laughs> the spear thing, like uh, that whole gag i thought was fine my biggest gripe with with the character and it's and this is also in the comics this is not just with the film she's so skilled and yet they've never explained why or how <laughs> and it carries on into this film she's you know the amazing with firearms her hand-to-hand -hand combat is you know unmatchable and that's fine that, that's completely fine to have that in a character but they've never how like i i would i just need a line of dialogue where oh she went and trained with these guys or she studied with these guys 
but at this point i've just accepted it even in the comics it's just like well harley quinn's just a great martial artist and she's amazing with firearms <laughs> and I, I just accepted it well, well yeah and that's always been the weird part that you know like since uh bruce tim created the character it's uh she she she's taking on these traits that just haven't been established you know like when when he was writing when it was when she was written in the original animated series and some of the other original properties and things you know uh like okay yeah she has some gymnastic skills she has a doctorate in psychology so she mentally can mess with people to some degree you know uh, or manipulate like and she has some experience with uh firearms and you know the sort of booby traps and things that the joker creates and that was her skill set and and she's an all right all right fighter from street fights but never like like you said one of the world's greatest martial artists and guns gunmen or anything you know which yeah. Is, is something that they seem to have tacked onto her. Like, but yeah, part of my problem, like you said, I've, I've come to go, okay, that, that I've come to a point where I'm like, all right, that's just who she is now. That's what they've made the character. But I don't like some of the, the wackiness and, you know, like just like the, the sort of the scene where you're seeing like the cartoon birds and the flowers and everything. You know? I could have done without that. I agree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I agree with you that, there are some very good scenes with her that I like. Like I like the whole romantic scene with the dictator and everything, where she shoots him at the end. I thought that I was the amount of blood. Yeah, <laughs> I was so impressed with the way that scene played out. I don't know. I I disagree because your guys' issue with her being able to fight, but there is a giant starfish monster that just comes out of nowhere, and there's yeah. <laughs> And there's a guy who can detach his arms and punch people, but you have an issue with. It's not that she can fight us. They've never told me. How, like, they get tell me a peacemaker was trained from childhood. Like, everyone gets this cool backstory. And they're like, Harley Quinn dated the Joker. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, they're like, she's a crazy clown. And, and she's also, like, just one of the best, uh, I guess, assassins of all time. For like, some I would love a story. I, I was going to say, I'm not fan of harley quinn by any means but it like i had zero issue with any of that Be, and more so just because i i didn't feel like it was important i don't care uh her scenes just like you said with the dictator that was amazing like some of it progressed the story and it did such a good job progressing the story that 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 part didn't cause an issue for me i think that it would have enhanced the story a ton if like you guys like you said brian this and we talk about all the time one line of dialogue can mean so much because they gave us the whole rat catcher backstory in like 30 seconds i loved it too Mm -hmm. yeah so the it i think it would have added to her character a great deal but i also didn't see birds of prey like i haven't seen any of her other movies so i don't know that they haven't done that so yeah that's a that's a good point and i think you know, and it it could be to some degree that we're being, you know, we're we're approaching it too much from a fanboy perspective, and yeah, you know, like that detail doesn't matter. That could be the case, but and also, I mean, and I think we both know why. Also, the the reason why she's so good at this is because she's a fan favorite, and you know, like she's a like this character is a cash cow for DC, so she's gonna have this these abilities, and she's gonna have some level of, of plot armor, you know, so. <laughs> Like, because this is this may not be what we want, but this is what the world wants. Well, from and this I, character, and but just like we've said before, that I didn't feel connected to her character in this movie, and I the scenes with her, I I enjoyed every scene with her, even the flower scene. I thought was it was over the top and kind of silly, but it reminded me of trauma, just that over the top, really weird kind of out of nowhere scene, and I, I liked it. But I think that, like you said, Brian, the it, to connect to a character like you do with Ratcatcher, all the stuff that happened with her, I really cared about. All the stuff with um, Idris Elba, you know, Blood Bloodsport, and not Bloodsport. That's a movie with Sean no. That's Clark. it. That, that's yeah, it. that's actually it. Mm-hmm. That was Bloodshot. Mm-mm. No, it's Bloodsport. Uh, Deadshot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sorry, too many. I mean, he's basically dead shot. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then Bloodshot well, and is a character. Too. Yeah. Bloodshot is uh, the Vin Diesel. Yes. Character. That's yeah. why I was. Yeah. 
but he did such a good job and you felt connected to that character. And I know we're going to talk about Peacemaker, but even that character, you felt connected to him. Uh, you felt like you were along for his journey as well. But with hers, it was just like she was there. And I have zero gripe with any of her scenes. I I can understand where your guys' gripe's coming from, but I liked them. So it, neither here nor there, but I think that connecting with the character goes a long way. And, you know, it made it to where if she wasn't in the next one, I wouldn't care. But if Bloodsport and Ratcatcher aren't, I'm going to be mad. Yeah. Because you connected with those characters along the way. The, speaking of Bloodsport, that opening scene with his daughter, that felt real as hell. Like that shit. I know. That scene elevated the entire film in my like when that scene came in early, and it's like, okay, yeah, this is Suicide Squad. It's gonna be fun, gags, James Gunn. That was one of those scenes where you're like, wow, this felt like some real world shit. And and that whole the whole dynamic they had and I, I, bravo to both actors for um pulling that scene off because it, it really helped establish him quick. And, 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 you know, as far as a character, and you're right, his performance was amazing. Like, if ever by the end of the credits, I'm sitting there, and, and if ever there was a, a debate about him being James Bond, make the man James Bond. It's no longer a question, a debate, a discussion. Idris Elba should be the next Bond. That's my stance. I agree. You know, I yeah. can't think of anyone better for for the for that role. You know, like you said, he was amazing, and he did a lot of James Bond stuff in this movie very well. The scene where they get captured in the van, where they surrender, you know, and everything, you know, that was very cool. It was him without the armor, you know, without any of his um, his his gear and stuff, just uh, just being a badass, just being a highly trained badass. And you know, it was like and like even the scene where they infiltrate the the club and everything prior to that, uh, and a lot of his planning stuff. I, I think it's just it just shows that he's very fit for that kind of role. Uh, Loved Blood Bloodsport overall. I think I loved the whole crew. I can't think of a character that I hated other than the Harley thing. I don't know, man. Weasel. Weasel, yeah. <laughs> Dude, I laughed. So <laughs> well, yeah, you don't like Weasel, but he does put that element of like, oh no, you know, this thing is loose in there. Like, what is this thing? You know, and I. <laughs> I hope to see. I hope to see Weasel in the next one. Yeah, TDK, the detachable kid, I thought was so funny because it's Nathan Fillion, which I didn't know that's who it was until I looked it up. No way. And I thought I was like his voice sounded so familiar. And I looked it up. I was like, oh my god, it just made it that much better. When they were shooting his arms, <laughs> he's just screaming like that whole. Um, yeah, that was great. Um, well, yeah, who, who selected him for that mission and, and why? You know, Waller couldn't have picked him herself. Well, but that's what she said at the beginning is, which is crazy because Rick and Harley were on the basically disposable team. Like, they sent that whole crew of people to, I mean, I don't think that she intentionally sent them to die, but she sent them to draw fire. And yeah, that, it, that's a good point. They, they were a decoy team. Yeah. I don't think she expected the entire army to be there, but <laughs> she thought, you know, yeah, they were the decoy. Uh, they were the larger group. Um, uh, I guess we'll, let's go to Polka Dot Man, and then we'll get into the meatier <laughs> characters. Um, you know, I just thought it was well done. This is an old sort of gimmicky c character. Um, if, you're, if you read Batman, he comes up every so often. He's referenced... He, um, we have the whole angle with his mom and in the end, you know him, I am a superhero and then he, he dies. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought the effects on him looked amazing. I was really impressed with the way it looked. Um, you know, I guess a combination of CG and then I guess some prosthetics, especially with the facial stuff, uh, at a few points, but it's in terms of a story arc, I, I very much enjoyed the character, but specifically his, to me, his character's main importance revolved around the Milton joke. <laughs> and I, you know, I've heard a few people online complain about this and we're going to go into some other scenes that were complained about, but the fact that 
Milton gets killed. Uh, who's, you know, I, I thought it was. The, this is a very trauma y James Gunn gag. But basically, this he has literally been with the crew for about half the movie at this point. He gets killed. Harley's like, "Who? Who the fuck is Milton?" Everyone's trying to figure it out. Like, <laughs> and you know, he's so heartbroken that this guy is dead. And I thought it was hilarious. But yeah, uh, that scene or polka dot man himself I, how did you guys i think? love the the milton scene and the build up to the milton scene you know looking back on it and, you know and the fact that she had no idea who who he was but polka dot man had built this attachment to him you know it was it was overall played really well and i even like the the scene where she confu- confuses uh uh blood sport with, <laughs> yeah. with with milton <laughs> He's like, that's not my name. And she's like, we just had this big conversation. Like, she's like, you're Milton. And, and, you know, the back and forth, that was good. That was, that's one of the Harley scenes that I really enjoyed. Uh, I, uh, Polka Dot Man, I think that, like you said, that was really well done. I, 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 I like what they did with this character. I was wondering what the angle was going to be because we got the idea that, okay, he's going to be depressed and potentially useless due to the trailers. And that's what I thought, you know, they didn't have, very many powers or that his abilities wouldn't be anything outside of what he does in the, the comics, but they gave him a, an interesting angle, you know, and I, and I do love the, the change to the character. I, I enjoyed it. The, I didn't know what his powers were going to be because I remember, you know, the old Adam West Batman <laughs> <laughs> kind of, you know, stuff, but I didn't know what his, what their portrayal of his powers would be. And I thought that was really whether it was CG or prosthetics or, I mean, some of it had to be CG, but it was so visually stunning that I, every time he was on scene, his overall demeanor and everything, it was, it was super funny. It was visually appealing. I I loved it. And then when they finally brought up his whole mom thing and showing (laughs) that everybody was his mom, like that, (laughs) that was so good and then like you said the milton joke you see milton helping them basically from about a halfway through the movie on but they never really establish him as <laughs> helping them or anything so for him to form this attachment to like an unimportant character is was brilliant and to me it not only built that character uh to where you had a connection to polka dot man but like you said, the little running gag going, uh, Harley's hole. <laughs> Who's Milton? <laughs> like everything in that end sequence. It, I, I don't know how else to put it. It just was really fun. It, it was a red shirt gag. And that's yeah. what the people that didn't get it. I was like, it was, it was, it was a, it was a joke, but it also had somewhat of a, <clears throat> not really a commentary, but just you, in a film like this or any film, you have your main characters and you always have the, the, the guys with them that all die. And it, that to me, that's what I got out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And you know, what's funny about that is even though he was a red shirt, he, he lasted longer than like half the cast. In this <laughs> yeah, movie. That's true. <laughs> you know, and I, I hope when you, I hope, uh, I hope I noticed now, and I hope it's already there on Suicide Squad merch. When you have the lineup of all the characters, I hope Milton's in there somewhere, and I just haven't noticed to, to till this point. I, that's something I'm going to look for a little later. I don't know, man. I want a javelin shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> javelin. <laughs> that little gag. <laughs> So yeah. there were two se- sequences that are, I guess, we'll say the controversial ones that, you know, some are saying, ah, oh, those were a little over top. Nothing offends me. I don't mind anything. But I will say these two scenes shock me. And th- these are two se- examples of two things that the MCU will never, ever, ever do. And that being um, the first one, <laughs> killing all the birds, lighting the bird cage on fire. Mm-hmm. I was like, you know, it's like, okay, there was that. And then. To me, the most shocking thing in the movie was the killing the Freedom Fighters gag, uh, <laughs> where it's like, all right, these are actually the guys on our side, and none of, and most of them are unarmed during the sequence. It's just sort of a blood sport and um, Peacemaker having a little kill off. You know, guys taking a bath, woman's like washing dishes, people are sleeping, and they're just brutally murdering them all, and then discover, oh shit, they're, they're on our side. 
And um, she's just like, well, fuck it. I still need you. So um, would you agree or disagree? Like to me, because like Deadpool, uh, Deadpool has edgy material and, you know, they're going to make an MCU version. And the first two films had a lot of edgy material. But jokes, that particular gag, I, I don't think the MCU would allow something like that or they would. Yeah, that, that's a little too edgy. I don't know. I, I I see so many fucked up movies, so for me, it's it's hard to under to know where the line even is. <laughs> but yeah, for some people, that was crossing the line. I was gonna say this is way low on the totem pole. Of, uh, I was I thought it would be more extreme. The film, I, like not to say it wasn't extreme, but by you know, I just watched the film Perdita Durango, and yeah. my God, <laughs> that film. <laughs> This movie has nothing on that movie in terms of uh, disturbing material. But anyways, what what are you guys' thoughts on the more edgy material? I enjoy it. And I don't think that... And to me, and we talked about it too, Like it's not controversial at all. They, them lighting the birdcage on fire. Now, had they CG'd a bunch of birds like going up in flames and flying into each other, like, that would have been, I think, pushing the envelope a little bit but just insinuating that it happened and showing it off off camera to me that wasn't like a huge big deal it was that guy it it was character it was developing the uh general new presidente character who was a giant piece of shit and he was all about power so that was him you know uh showing that he was in control now that the other guy was a dreamer and trying to do these things the right way where he was going to do it more the militaristic way. And I saw zero issue with that. The freedom fighter gag, I was dying laughing. Like (laughs) I laughed harder once I found out what it was. And to me, it was played for bits. It was played for laughs and it was pushing the envelope on purpose. But to me, I wasn't like offended in the slightest. Yeah, I. That's actually one of my favorite scenes in the movie. To the point where I went back and rewatched it. You know the uh, the competition between uh, <laughs> Bloodsport and uh, and Peacemaker. There, I, I love that it was one of their biggest fuck ups, and it was also you know your badass standoff before your between your two top badasses on the team. You know, just uh, trying to out kill each other. You know, because normally it would be like a you know like an epic scene where it's these two you know your two top tough guys you know trying to outperform each other and you know they're performing over confidently and they were very confident in what they did. It's just they were killing, they were killing the wrong side, you know. And it it, it was a gag in the end. And you know, it, you, and I and like you said, I love that whole scene. One of my favorite scenes in the movie. I love when he shot the fan. Uh. Yeah, that one was great because. <laughs> You know, I, I didn't even notice, like, dude was in a tub at first. I was like, where's this going? <laughs> like, yeah, uh, that, that, that was, <laughs> that, that made me laugh. That was, that was pretty great, you know, like, uh, and, uh, and as far as any of the edgier scenes, like, I don't know, I guess, uh, I guess like y'all said, I guess my barometer for that stuff is kind of off because we watch a lot of the same thing. So it didn't seem, I wasn't really bothered by anything in the, in the film. I, I guess what most people wanted was, you know, something that they could, watch with their kids i mean but it's suicide squad so that's that's not what you're gonna get yeah i I completely agree (laughs) that that's that is not at all what you're gonna get um but yeah i i agree i I didn't have any issues with any of that those were the scenes that stuck i read tried to read all the like positive reviews and then all the like really negative ones and those were some of the things that stuck out um let's go into peacemaker and um man (laughs) Like you, like you were saying, we, 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 I love that whole back and forth between him and uh, Bloodsport, but <clears throat> I, I was genuinely impressed by that third act turn when not only does he fight and kill Rick Flag, and I felt bad, like I was upset that Rick Flag died in that scene, uh, but then we get the sequence with Ratcatcher. And I'm sitting there, and man, she sold that shit. Like, you felt horrible for her. You know, like, why are you going to kill me? And he's just like, I'm thorough. And he's going to do it. And then the, the beautiful hero pose. We have Bloodsport falls in as this hero, and we get the nice draw where they both shoot, and the, we get the callback to the scene when they first met. The bullet's smaller. It goes through his bullet, shoots him in the neck. 
all that is brilliant. And, and you know what I mean? In terms of writing and callbacks to the past. And I loved all of it. Of course, we learned that he in fact has survived um, in the end credits. We knew that he was getting a show. They had said it was a prequel. Now we know it's not a prequel. It's a sequel. And in fact, James Gunn is trying to get a second season greenlit. The first season will be eight episodes that drops in January on HBO Max. And James Gunn directed most of the episodes, not all. Um, but what do you think about Peacemaker and the fact that he's going to continue on? And some of these characters, the ones that survived, might be in it. We don't. We have no idea. We don't really know anything about the show at this point, or even what his objective is, other than it's to save the world. I I kept waiting because. Brian, you had told me that someone was like, all the stuff the Peacemaker did was unredeemable. So he started by killing Rick Flagg. And in all reality, he was just like, hey, man, don't make me do this. This is the mission. And yeah. yeah. So I was not, I was like, that's not unredeemable. And then he stood over top of Ratcatcher and I was like, oh, well, this might be what they're talking about. (laughs) Because, you know, she, throughout this movie, she was one of my favorite characters. And not just because, her whole personality, the backstory. And this is what we were talking about before with Harley. You get this very short backstory with her, but it, you know, connected you to her character. So when you see Peacemaker standing over top of her, it, it made you not like him all of a sudden. Uh, Because even prior to that, it, he was funny, even killing Rick. I was not against that. I, I mean, I was upset that Rick died, but I understood what Peacemaker was doing. But then when he was talking about being thorough and killing Ratcatcher, I was like, well, fuck. I said, that's the uh, unredeemable part. And then, you know, he ends up getting shot in the neck. But his character throughout this makes me very excited about his show. (laughs) Oh, yeah, absolutely. I I cannot wait to see that show. Um, And, uh, yeah, and I get it. I I, I get what you're saying when people thought he was irredeemable. I, I, I get why. Because... Like you said, that seemed like a very cold scene, the thing with Ratcatcher and and the way that, and just how coldly and methodically he went about doing what he was doing. But, you know, he kind of established this very on. It was very, very much, you know, who this character was, that he cared about peace more than anything. And, like, now we're getting an idea of what his idea of peace is, you know. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, so to him, he was preserving the peace, and he was the one character that had a goal that went against everybody else's goal. And so it, it it was a heel turn that made a lot of sense, uh, you know, very well acted by by John Cena. You know, I I, lo- I loved seeing like the antagonistic relationship between him and Bloodsport, and you know, even like and the way that him Bloodsport and Rick Flag worked together during the scenes that they were working together it was just very cool. You know, made me really anticipate this this uh, the series. Well, hell, this movie overall did that. Uh, and remember, yes. he was there on orders from Waller. He had a separate mission going uh, to to contain that information. Right. So he was he was following his orders to the T. He, oh. His character just reminded me of the the one rogue in the D and D party that you don't know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, watch your back. <laughs> they have their own agenda the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> like the whole time I'm watching it, that's all I could think of because he was just doing his own thing. You know, when King Shark watched him go down the elevator, like everything he was doing, that's that's all I could think of the whole time was that one rogue in the party that's just like, Yeah, I'm gonna go over here and you're like, Fuck go, going into Ratcatcher, a uh, Ratcatcher too, but I, I just call her Ratcatcher. Um her father was Ratcatcher and I mean, like, so subtle. They didn't take take a whole lot of time. You're right. The, between her forge and we get the the scene in the bus, which I thought was beautifully done. We get the scene, which was very emotional when she's fighting Starro at the end, and we get the scene of her thinking of her father and the you know why he chose rats. Um, we get a display of her abilities. We get the whole angle of her talking about she's going to save Bloodsport. No, he's going to save her. And we get, he does save her against Peacemaker, but then she saves everyone with the uh, Starro fight. Like I said, when you really dig down, and, and I was reading some reviews, and they were they were saying, oh, good, dumb, fun. Yes, it is that, but there's a the script is more clever than I think some people are giving it credit for. There's a lot of interesting callbacks and uh, little details within the script, and her character especially has a lot of those moments. So, very impressed with the character. 
we got to get more of her. I think she's going to be a fan favorite out of this Sebastian, the little rat. I, when he's yeah. waving or trying to get a handshake, I fucking <laughs> loved it. Um, yeah, rat catcher as a whole. And the sh- that's how you do an origin. And see how simple and quick and efficient it was? Like, the, bravo to James Gunn to bring that character in. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. We talked about that line of dialogue kind of stuff. It was a very short scene. And I love that it was Tiki White TD or whatever was uh, the first rat catcher. But he, uh, it, it was such a short sequence. And then, like you said, the callback to that sequence later to kind of hammer home the importance of what her character is. And it, like you said, it's not just a fan favorite. It's so well written that when you think of what they did with you know, the Avengers, you have these big name characters, you have all these things and how well James Gunn did writing this like sub character that has kind of shitty powers actually, (laughs) but did such a good job making them likable that you really want to see more of them. Yeah. Yeah. Red catcher was a, was a great character. That was, that's one character that, you know, I came into this movie thinking, nah, I'm not going to care much about her, Ratcatcher, and likely due to her what her powers are, you know, like I, I, I kind of thought, okay, she's going to get killed off at some point in this movie. But you know, it was a, it was very well acted. Like you said, it was, it, it you know, it, it was essential to the movie, and he made all the abilities fit of the members of the crew that survived. You know, like you said, in particular, her. Uh, it all fit in the way that it made. Amanda Waller's plan kind of makes sense, you know, the way things just kind of came together. How cool was now? I was, I would, this was something that none of us have talked about, and I really want your opinion. I thought the whole Starro sequence battle and the way they defeated him, including the Harley point with the jab, you know, continuing the javelin gag, which ran for the entire film. Um, I loved it. And I was impressed by it. And, you know, we I that's something we complain about a lot when we're talking about comic book movies or even shows at this point when it comes to that sort of final battle or that final boss. A lot of times uh, it's, it's just they feel they mail it in or, you know, it's just not that impressive. To me, this oddly was like really well done to the point where it, it might be one of my favorite. And because you know, I'm sitting there and like on paper, it sort of sounds stupid. <laughs> it's like, all right, Rackett, she's going to summon a bunch of rats and they're going to fucking eat the starfish giant starfish and then harley's gonna poke through the eye and they're gonna go in the eye and chew it apart like on paper it sort of sounds dumb but in practice and the way it was shot and i like the shot of rat catcher sitting there remembering her father and the tears are in her eyes and her fighting a she's fucking summoning rats to kill a giant space god basically like it was fucking cool and i was very impressed with it uh, to the point where it might be one of my favorite final battles in comic book movies. I bitch about it all the time in the MCU. I think this was done way better than a lot of what they put forward. Yes. Uh, we look at not just Endgame, but look at like the Ultron final battle sequence. <laughs> what, you know what I'm saying? It's just a subpar kind of villain. Uh, which sucks because in the comics, he's, you know, a genuinely really cool villain. And then you have Starro is just kind of this weird <laughs> sub character in the comics and make him the highlight of this movie. And it's so well written and so well portrayed and <laughs> the the creativeness of how to destroy him and everything else was so over the top. But so well done that it's, and we talked about it too, Brian, the body horror and the whole horror sequence leading up to that scene. It's, this movie had so many aspects of, of trauma, but so many aspects of just James Gunn, like just kind of his, you got to see what his true uh, calling in life was. With <laughs> this. And the horror sequence, when you saw the, starfish peel off the guy's face so many of the scenes in the last you know 35 minutes or so like you said brian i don't know that this isn't one of my favorite ones as far as like final battles period and comic book movies it was really good 
Yeah, yeah, agreed. It was a it was a really good battle, and I was just I was amazed at how well they did Starro because you know prior to this movie, if you told me that your main villain for a DC movie is going to be Starro, I would say that movie's going to bomb and that it's going to be garbage. You know because uh, it's a it's a character that's hard to to pull off and and I think make work. You know and especially in a, well in a movie in particular. You know, giant space starfish. Uh, it was it was really well done. It was uh, you know it was a uh, it was interesting. Like well, it was really well done, and it was a really good fit, I think, for this team of characters because you know it's it's Suicide Squad, so nobody is a is a Superman level character. So you know, how do these individuals, the like these low level heroes, and you know, like and uh, like expert marksmen and stuff, how do they handle this? A a cosmic threat. On, on this scale, so it was a, it, you know, given that it was really well done and it was a, it was the best finisher I think they could have gone for, you know, uh, of, especially having a believable threat for this team to handle in the DC universe. Because James, because what I think James Gunn and this was so clever is he took, like you said, Larry, sort of this joke of a of a villain, and he said, well, if that existed in the real world. That's fucking horrifying. If you yeah. really, you know, and he he really went deep into the horror elements of a creature that can, you know, take over, you know, the people around it and and just the whole concept of it, you know, like you said at the end of the day, I mean, it's those are head crabs, man. Like you're, yeah. you're essentially zombies. You're and he doubled down on that that aspect of it and made it disturbing and very very just like you're gross. You're like, "Oh my god, Starro's horrifying." He really did. I mean, the whole epiphany that you don't survive it because, you know, I thought, okay, they're going to do something or they'll kill the main starfish and, you know, the starfishes will fall off everybody's face and they'll be fine. We've seen that in the DC animated universe before and in the comics. Okay, yeah, they kill or stop Starro and everybody's fine. But in this movie, they decided, oh, oh no, it latches to you. The moment it latches to you, you're dead. You know, so that kind of upped the ante and that's the sort of thing I think that we wouldn't have gotten from a Marvel movie, and no, I agree. You know, and, and it's it's also good that we we for once another thing I complain about in Marvel movies they didn't do the whole oh they're fighting mirror images of themselves we didn't get that we got a very unique enemy, and that's that's my complaint for a lot of Marvel vil- villains it's either they fight mirror images of themselves or they fight you know just sort of a kind of cookie cutter villain with the exception of Loki and Thanos that's what a lot of their villains are, you know, and this is someone who in, enjoys those movies. The, the star Wars scene reminded me of plankton and the first SpongeBob movie. <laughs> right. Yeah. But all like the jump buckets on everybody's head. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, um, there was a missed joke. There was a missed opportunity for a joke, I think, and I'm glad they didn't do it, but I was thinking about it the whole film. And then even at the end and they didn't do it. And I was like, ah, it's, it's sort of childish, but it would have been funny. So, we have the whole sequence where Peacemaker, they're doing the, the debriefing and they're talking about Star, Project Starfish and he talks about it being a butthole. Uh, could it be a butthole as another name for butthole? And my thought was, oh, what if what if the uh, spawn attaches to your asshole? <laughs> and then like you're bent over and walking around with the starfish like on your butthole. And then, you know, I could see Peacemaker being like, oh, see, I told you. <laughs> and and it, I don't know. In my mind, that was in the movie, and it. Sh- I was like, that's just an obvious gag, and you know, a bunch of people walking around bent over with the starfish, up the, you know, on their ass. And but then I guess you already took out Peacemaker before that would have had. I don't know. It it was a gag that I thought was. It was one of those things where you just sort of see it coming, but it didn't happen. And I don't know. Well, well, yeah, I agree. You know, like, and even if it was to the face with most of them and it only attached, you know, the wrong way on one guy who was like maybe in the restroom at the time or something, but that's the first one that peacemaker encounters. And, you know, he's just like, I knew it, you know, (laughs) that could have been funny. You're absolutely right. You know, so missed opportunity. I thought there was going to be something like that in this too. Um, there's other characters. Um, We've went through all the main ones. Uh, I'll just we did have the thinker uh, p- played by Peter Capaldi. He was fine for the role. Obviously, Amanda Waller. Let's talk about Amanda Waller's team. Like the fact that they had a role and that they were a part of the film even in the beginning, and they they take bets on the heroes. And 
they're you know upset with some of her methods and then of course we get the ending sequence where she's going to kill uh, Bloodsport because he's going to go back and fight Starro and they knock her unconscious and that leads to her gonna she's going to use Peacemaker in her next mission she's got that team working with him they hate him all those dynamics and the fact that I'm assuming well shit I guess that means Amanda Waller is in the Peacemaker show um, what did you think about sort of her team specifically I thought that was really great. You know, that that a lot of little characters there. Like I didn't I didn't expect to be interested in the control room stuff or any of the characters in that control room, but it was uh it was it was very cool. They were played very well. Uh, you know, it felt like it was as much a part of the movie that fit as well as anything else. And uh and also like my guess is with given Amanda Waller, if we're getting if we're getting another suicide squad movie that analyst that knocked her out, you're, you're likely going to see her in roughly the same position that you saw Bloodsport at the beginning of the movie where she's scrubbing the floors in the prison. <laughs> yeah. Because you don't just knock out Amanda Waller if you're working for Amanda Waller. That's not something you get away with. I don't know. That whole sequence, uh, I was dying laughing. Uh, when she... What, what was it? It looked like a mic stand. I know it wasn't, but that's what it was. It was her like. golf club. Oh, remember shit. she was oh, she was okay. practicing golf earlier. Yes, I do. I remember now. Now that you mention it, but her just like clobbering her in the head with that. It, I I was dying, and then her taking charge and telling why be like get back to fucking work. <laughs> it, you know, as she's storming off the floor, it that whole sequence with her being defiant and the rest of the squad kind of standing up to her. I am curious as to. If uh, Viola Davis has a role in the show at all, and you're going to have like Peacemaker, I, I I think it'd be a little bit over the top if he killed some of these people for standing up to her, but I wouldn't be surprised at all. <laughs> yeah, it's eight episodes. I mean, that's a huge arc, and she, you know, if she's in the show as much as she is, say that this, they could have shot shit. They could shoot all her stuff in a couple days. You know, she's in a couple scenes. I don't. We we have no idea what the structure of the show is or what exactly is going on. So you know, I don't I don't know if each episode's a different kind of mission or if it's one overarching thing. I'm assuming it is. No clue. Uh, all I know is James Gunn did say he's he's trying to get a second season greenlit um, before the season one even airs. So <laughs> it should be interesting. Um, didn't go into King Shark much. There's not much to say. He's sort of a comic gag, but he, he's part of the team and he does a lot, really. Um, we know Sylvester Stallone played the voice. He did a handful of lines for the character. I like the dynamic between him and um, Ratcatcher. Yet again, that was building her character up and the whole aspect of you know the, the scene about being friends and right after he tried to eat her. <laughs> um, I, but I mean, but, he was your he was your Drax. It, it, yes. Well, it's funny you say that, you know, Batista, he wanted Batista to play Peacemaker. Huh. And he, he specifically was using Peacemaker for Batista, but he was in the middle of shooting something. And it, it just didn't match up, so that's when he went to, John Cena ended up getting it. So I thought that was interesting. I I think that King Shark, to me, was like, if uh, similar to Groot, like the amount of lines... He had and the kind of lines he had just remind me of Vin Diesel doing Groot. But <laughs> he was like, I am Groot, Groot, Groot. You know, just the different <laughs> variations. But as soon as I heard the voice, I knew who it was. And it just it felt like it fit. <laughs> and <laughs> it, all I could hear was like Adrian the whole time, but Adrian, like I would God. It, <laughs> I wish that they would have done something like that. Like him just eat somebody and say it. And then rat catcher or somebody be like, who is that? And he'd be like, nobody, <laughs> like, you know, anything like that. And the comic relief in, I mean, the whole movie was comic relief, but when they were doing the briefing and raising his hand and, you know, just eating everyone and then trying to eat rat catcher while she's in the deepest sleep that I've ever seen anybody <laughs> Be ever, uh, it I, I enjoyed it, and even the part where he's in the giant aquarium and playing with the fish that tried to eat him at the end, it everything about it was fun. 
Uh, I don't think that it's super important, but like you said, uh, a Groot or Drax. I think more Groot than Drax. Yeah, he felt like a he felt like a Groot Drax hybrid of sorts. You know? Yeah. yeah, like and we had an extra Groot in Sebastian the Rat. You know, just like one more you know, sort <laughs> of cute, memeable character. You know, for the audience. Sebastian was funny though. I did like that. I like love dude <laughs> when he was trying to shake uh, Bloodsport's hand. <laughs> yeah, like, you want me to shake his hand? Or he's just waving. She's like, "Why is he waving? I think he's friendly." <laughs> um, and he, I love that he was in the battle. He ran up and was actually ju- jumped through the eye. If you notice, he had his little backpack thing on. Yep. Yeah, and he was swimming in the in the eye. Um, yeah, I loved him. Um, like that, and the and the final big resolution was uh, was blood sport, you know, trying to accept Sebastian and you know just petting him. <laughs> towards petting him. <laughs> the, uh, but yeah, like you said up front, Spencer, that <clears throat> this is what I want DC to do: uh, Snyder Cut, Joker, Suicide Squad. Just embrace the R rating. Let let the directors do whatever they want. These are those are three films where the directors were basically told do whatever the fuck you want. We don't care. Um, th- my only recommendation to the studio maybe drop the budgets a little bit. Similar to Joker, Joker is a good example. Drop your budgets a little bit. Uh, that way you're not losing money if it turns out it doesn't perform well. And what well, I say that, but we're in this weird pandemic era where. The box office is clearly dead, and it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> that opinion, whatever. Um, yeah, that's yeah. my concern. That they're they're definitely going to drop the budget. So that'll be the one. <laughs> yeah, that'll be the one thing yeah. that'll happen. <laughs> I, yeah, things things but, aren't looking good. But I look at movies. My voice squeaked there. That was weird. Um, <laughs> but a movie like Joker, they didn't have a huge budget. A lot of the horror movies that have these low budgets that are anything Jordan Peele did. They're still super interesting, low mm-hmm. budget. Uh, even Deadpool wasn't, didn't have a huge budget. Not the but, first one. No. Mm-hmm. And it was so well done. You, So I don't think that it's necessary, but I think that all the cover-ups with bad stories and shit, they can't just Michael Bay it away. Like you actually have to have a good story. <laughs> So I think that that actually will probably produce some better movies. I, it, it's Twilight Zone syndrome, where it's like, all right, you got a room in a box, <laughs> you got to write a twenty-two minute story. Go. Uh, yeah, that benefit. Yeah, it, it really could like, and like you said, a little more creative fr- freedom because whoever's making you know these executive decisions that we have to change this thing in a movie or that thing, you know, they have been ruining. DC has been butchering its own comic book movies for years, it seems. You know, they haven't had really anything that has been good or memorable since the Dark Knight trilogy. At least, well, at least in my opinion. I don't disagree. As soon as... Well, the Snyder Cut was amazing of Justice League. but And I liked Man of Steel. But that was, to me, embracing the darker side. As opposed to... in. You know, people are like, well, Wonder Woman was a box office success, so was Aquaman, but I don't like those versions of the DC movies. Like, they're they're funny, but to me, they're emulating Marvel too much. Uh, yeah. Same thing with the version that they released of Justice League before the Snyder Cut. It, it's like they're trying to do Marvel, but... They haven't given us the same because for Marvel to be successful, shit, there's been like 72 movies. <laughs> and that's the reason that that was because it, it has a similar vibe. Like you, all these movies intertwine and DC can't do that because we don't have the connection to those characters as much. So when you try to do the lighthearted stuff, it to me, it just feels disingenuine. So to me, if they embrace this kind of like, like you said, the rated R version, it, I think that it would be way more successful than uh, they keep trying to do the Marvel knockoff. I, I don't know what the rating is going to be for the new Batman trilogy, but the the rumors and the buzz on the street is that the studio is slightly concerned 
because it is it might not get an R rating, but it's damn sure close, and they think mm. it might be too dark, and they don't know if that's a smart move with Batman. Supposedly, there's a lot of behind the scenes discussions because if you just seen the tra- the trailer, uh, they are going in that almost seven you know vibe with it, and mm. the Riddler is like a serial killer, and you know, and I'm like, I I say let it go, let him do it, let him go for it. <laughs> who cares yeah i mean if you've ever read a batman comic yeah. it's often it's often that dark you know he's, he's batman deals with people who are criminally insane most of the time you know or like there there are some very messed up batman villains that you only get in the games the comics and for some reason the animated movies but not the movies uh you know like yeah. your, your calendar mans and whatnot you know you're he, your he had knows. a cameo did you know yep. did you see him I, I didn't see him. Although. He was in Suicide Squad. Yeah, uh, he's in one scene. He, um, it's uh, James Gunn's brother. He played Weasel, but he also was Calendar Man. He's in one shot, and he's got the calendar, the dates written around his head. And That's interesting. There. Yeah, I, 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 there's a couple videos that all the Easter eggs. There's a shit ton of Easter eggs in this movie. A, a lot of stuff I missed. I, I heard, I heard online, you know, like that. Uh, the guy who played uh, Polka Dot Man. Is uh is also the same person who voices Calendar Man in the in the games in the Arkham <laughs> games and also in the Long Halloween movie. You know, oh wow! A little interesting factoid there. So yeah, we we liked it. If you're still listening, it's clear by now uh, we enjoyed the film. Is there? That's everything I wanted to talk about. Is there anything else you guys want to talk about regarding the Suicide Squad? Uh, just the opening sequence. Okay. Where- Literally, everyone died. Uh, not literally, <laughs> figuratively, everyone died. Uh, I that sequence was when we talk about shock value. That to me shocked me. The you know, yeah, boomerang. You had <laughs> all these characters you were basically putting on posters and stuff. When you had uh, Pete Davidson, who was billed to be this super important character, blackguard. Yeah, yeah, he wasn't. <laughs> So, you know, Javelin comes out. Savant. Nathan Fillion, who is a, I won't say he's an A-list actor, but he's one of the, he's a bigger actor. And even Michael Rooker, who is yeah. in the trailer. You have all these characters who were billed to be these, the new squad. Like, all these people were going to go through. And even Boomerang. You know, Captain Boomerang getting blown to shit like all these characters i did not see that coming and i loved uh was it mongrel the yeah the, yeah, the, yeah the helicopter and crash that the entire opening sequence uh with everyone dying and then finding out that that wasn't the suicide squad the new suicide squad was blood sport they were on the opposite side of the island so it, how it opened um I think would be a great way to just, if they wanted to make multiples of these, uh, same thing. They kept Rick going and they had Harley Quinn continue on. So do the same thing where it's, they're the distraction. And then they they introduce us to another suicide. It, I think it'd be a great running gag to kind of start each movie. That, and that's the, I, I just, I think it'd be funny. That's actually one, one of the things I was going to say, you know, like, cause I thought, that the guy we were following in the beginning, I thought that was like one of our main POV characters for for the <laughs> for the Savant. movie. I thought that dude was yeah. I thought Savant yeah. was going to make it, you know. But you know, this was a this was a funny way to start it. You know, the stars with this person, and we're we're in a sail, and you think like and definitely the way they presented him and everything, you thought this was going to be like your main badass that of this group. If anybody was going to survive, it would have been him, you know. But. He eats it very early on and isn't relevant for the rest of the movie. That was that was a pretty great way to start. It was pretty funny. Yeah, uh, the whole movie, especially that opening sequence after that, and then we get the flashback with the other team forming. And there's so many great villains in DC that I was thinking, oh, I would love for them to be there and this character. But most of them I realized were Flash villains. So I was thinking, oh, Captain <laughs> Cold, Pied Piper, and all these. But then I was like, you know what? They're now starting to do Flash stuff, so they, they got to save them. It's like, no, we actually are doing Flash now, so we got to use all those characters for something else. Um, that's one of the things about DC. One of the things that why I enjoy reading the comics is 
they have so many great little villains or you know that that aren't you know you know they're not thanos they're not gonna conquer the world but they're they're a pain in the ass to their to, to the hero they fight and they're very well developed and and this is a film that showed an example of that where you take all these sort of b c d level characters and show they're actually very interesting and look we can build a whole fucking movie around them and that's one of the i think highlights of uh dc over marvel for me i i agree with you on that because you know uh, i think you know that <laughs> anyway because you know it's like you like following their your captain boomerangs you know your your, your tricksters your your uh like I'm Dude. again, I'm naming a bunch of Flash villains, but you know, the Flash, Flash villains, best, yeah, he has such you a know, great sort rogue. of D list yeah. rogues. He has the best ones, you know. But DC is good about that, and there are a lot of interesting characters. But Dude, you know, it, like, and I, I think a lot of the characters that died are also characters that have legacy characters. Like we know, like, oh, Captain Boomerang died. Well, we'll get a Boomerang Junior. Mm-hmm. You know that that's a thing. Yeah, Mirror Master, man, it's one of my favorites. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Flash has a hell of a rogues gallery. Um, but yeah, uh, anything else? No. Nah. Yeah, I think that's all for me. I, so, I yeah. love this movie. I want to see a third one. I, the, yeah. If I got to say anything else, it's that. you know. And it's been a long time since I've been able to say that about a DC movie. And I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that you know, it was this one because, you know, we... Well, I, I don't know how much Suicide Squad Spencer read, but I know you and I were pretty big Suicide Squad Squad fans back in the day. Yeah, and Secret. I was a big Secret Six guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm I'm hoping for like Checkmate and stuff. I'm hoping we get those kind <laughs> yeah. of things. Um, but yeah, I, I uh, we love the movie. Um, like I said up front, if you not hit the sub button, please do so. We got more reviews coming your way. Peacemaker series is in January. I'm sure we'll be covering that since it's an extension of this film. And, uh, yeah, we appreciate everyone listening, and we will see you all next time. Oh, I just, before I say bye, I just wanted to tell everybody, watch all the DC shit on HBO Max, because it'll keep giving them a bigger budget. Bye. Watch all the shit on HBO Max. <laughs> <laughs> bye.